Romans chapter number 5. I'm going to begin reading verse number 1. The Bible says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glorify in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For when ye were without, for when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Now, in these couple of verses, I mean, already in the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul's already dealt with the law and how circumcision only was of profit under the law. He said, Christ made circumcision none effect. He says, if guilty of one part of the law, circumcision doesn't do you any good. And if Christ saved you, it doesn't do you any good then either. He's saying there's no glorification, there's no holiness, there's no earning your way so to speak with God by works he says the only work that ever counted was the work that God said he would perform in the Old Testament and the one that he said I did perform in the New Testament that was the work that Christ did on Calvary he says that's the only work that matters then by the time we get to here to chapter number 5 he says therefore or in other words because of what Christ did for us on Calvary he spent a lot of time talking about that in chapter number 4 he says, being justified by faith. Again, not by works. We can go to Ephesians where he wrote, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of works. Don't have much clearer you can get in that, Brother Ron. I mean, not of works. I mean, don't know how you can, that's what, that's a tangent, we won't go off on it, but that's why they're, having to change the Bible to why they've always tried to change the Bible because they know that the Bible doesn't line up what they teach so they try to change the Bible and make sure that it doesn't preach against the things that they believe but that's a lesson for a different day not of works that justified by faith he says because of our faith not because your faith was any special God gave unto every man a measure of faith that doesn't mean that God gave to one a certain measure and then one another. No, no. God's no respecter of persons. We each got the same amount of faith put in us by God. Right? How much was it? Enough to get saved. Because it's His will that none should perish. He says, by exercising that faith and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, we can go over to chapter number 9 of the book of Romans where he says, For with the mouth confession is made under repentance, with the heart man believeth under righteousness. Right? It's not the confession, although if you believe in your heart, it's going to come out your mouth. Right? In other words, he's saying, if you ask Jesus to save you, believing that he will, he will. Well, he says, by that faith, which you didn't come up, on, come up with on your own, God gave it to you. Right? You didn't have to figure out who to put your faith in. God already told you. He came to where you were, dealt with you, and convicted you personally of your need of the Savior. He's saying, God did everything for all you had to do was accept it, believe it. In fact, later on in this chapter, he refers to it as the free gift. Because it was no strings attached, no price, you know, no cost of admission. All it took was you using what God gave you to believe what God had already done for you. He says, by that faith, we have peace with God. That's one thing to have a peace that passeth all understanding. You know why you can have that peace? Because in your soul, you're at peace with God Almighty. There is no conflict between you and God the Father because your sins have been not just forgiven. They've been done gone with. Right? He said they're gone. Not behind his back. Not put into a book on a shelf that he's not going to look at for a while. No, he said they are gone. Right? Because you are no longer the enemy of God. Because while we were sinners, we were with, at enmity with God. Our very existence was a testament that God created something that chose not to voluntarily worship Him. That man sinned against God. That made us the enemy of God. 
But now, because our sin has been covered by the blood, right, it's been done away with, now we can have peace with God the Father. Right? Not have strife, not have turmoil. I mean, we could take the Bible and show you that everything going out there, all the strife, all the conflict, that's a result of the fact that the world has no peace because they are in sin. Right? Everything from the war that's happening halfway around the world all the way down to why people bicker and argue. It's because they have no peace. But see, this is, isn't peace with another person. Right? There are people signing trees all the time and breaking them before the ink's even dry. Right? Not talking about that kind of peace. Talking about true peace. Lasting peace that can't be revoked. He says, right, we have peace with God. He doesn't say that for the moment we have peace with God. No, that is a definite statement for all of time. If you're under the blood, you are at peace with God the Father because when He looks at you, He sees you robed in the righteousness of Christ. You will never suffer the judgment for your sins because you were judged for sin at Calvary. You have peace, not just now, all eternity. Right? But He's not just talking about sin. Because we're no longer the enemy of God, he says, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. He says, you don't just have peace because God's not going to judge you for sin. You're not just in a relationship now. You're part of the family. right? You've been adopted. You've been born in. One day we're going to get married in. right? You're in the family. You have peace with God the Father. But he says, but now, also through our Lord Jesus Christ, who we put our faith in, he says you also get access. You know what that means? It's not limited to you anymore. I cannot. Now I'll tell you this story. I'm not kidding you. Friday at work, somebody called a phone number that's in our system for one of our customers we talk to all the time. Phone number and the computer was wrong. And the supervisor of our parts department called and got interrogated on the phone because apparently just one number off from one of our distributors is a private phone number that nobody should have that you get to talk to somebody at Area 51. He did not have access to talk to whoever was on the other side of that phone line. In fact, they threatened that they were going to retrace and you know, they kept asking him all these questions. They just kept saying, I, if you'd let me answer, I'll tell you who I am, where I'm calling for. We're running a trace on the phone line. He says, I'll tell you right where I'm at. It was just a mistake. Right? Sorry, but we didn't know any better. We just called the phone number that was in our system. Right? But he didn't have access to that. He couldn't, I mean, used to be in the Marines. Right? He had a DOD number at one point, served over in the Middle East. But that doesn't mean he can just pull up to Area 51 and say, hey, I want to have a look around. He can't even call, let alone show up. Right? He has no access. Right? Likewise, you guys ever have a bank that you get a direct deposit and it's showing that you have the money but you don't have access to the money? It's like, well, here's your balance. Well, if that's my balance, I should be able to spend it. Right? No, it has to clear. Well, if it didn't clear, why is it showing up? Another one of my pet peeves. Okay, but you don't have access to it until they say that you have access to it. Right? Well, the grace of God, don't know who it was, right? But said it's a a liter you know, you could take the letters of the word grace and it comes out to God's riches at Christ's expense. Because we are at peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, now we also, through our Lord Jesus Christ, have access to the grace of God. What before, we had no knowledge of. Now, we, we can understand mercy. Now, you first get saved, you understand, God didn't give me what I deserved. Every day that we breathed as a sinner, we deserve to be thrown off into hell. The day that we were conceived in sin, we deserve to be sent off to hell. The day that we were born in sin, we deserve to be thrown off into hell. Right? But God didn't do it. We understand mercy. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. But what is grace? That's all the good things that we still don't deserve that God gives us on purpose. Right? Did not the psalmist say that daily he loadeth us with benefits? 
the psalmist knew a whole lot about mercy, but the psalmist wasn't under the blood yet. Truly, you think about daily He loads us with benefit. Just the fact that God lets us breathe is a benefit. Not to mention everything else that He does behind the scenes that we won't know until we get to glory. Not the fact that He doesn't shut the oxygen off every day for some of the stupid things that people do. That's a good thing that I don't have my button on that switch. But I tell everybody else, hey, hold your breath for about a minute. We're going to take care of about half of these idiots. But, what do we say? It's not just not getting what you don't deserve. Now God's being good to you on purpose, even though we know that we don't deserve it. In fact, look at how the Apostle Paul wrote it. We have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand. You want to know what the foundation of a Christian's life is? The grace of God. Right? We know that we're standing on the promises. We know that our companion through the Holy Ghost, right, that He is our comforter. Right? He's our guide. The Bible says that the Holy Ghost will lead and guide us into all truth. Right? We know that there are the foundation, but really, you know why you can stand every day in your Christian life? Without being overtaken by the world, overtaken by hell, overtaken by your own flesh. You're able to stand. You're able to live the life that God wants you to live by the grace of God and nothing else. If it was up to our strength, the arm of flesh will fail you. That if a man thinketh he stand, let him take heed lest he fall. That we can look at how man isn't enough. So why are we standing if we are standing by the grace of God? What allows you to, one, discern what God wants you to do, then two, understand it the way that God wants you to do it, and then have the capability to go out and do it, the grace of God. It's not because you arrived, it's not because you have a supernatural understanding of the Scriptures, it's because God said, I like that boy. More than that, I've loved him with an everlasting love. And even though he doesn't have what it takes to know, even though if I told him, he wouldn't be able to understand it. But, and even if he did understand it, he's not able to go out and do it to my satisfaction. But because I love him, and because he loves me, I'll give him the ability to show out that love towards me. Right? We don't stand right because of who our forefathers in the faith are. We don't stand because of how good the pastor preaches on Sunday. We don't stand because of how much prayer time or how much Bible study we did this week. The only reason we're standing is by the grace of God. And then you extrapolate that off into, look at most of it, we're doing more than just standing. We thrive. Right? We've been blessed with more than we ever thought that we'd be able to have, let alone, you know, in our wildest dreams, think that we'd be able to actually own it or actually do it or have certain people in our lives who did all that God through his grace you don't just stand you survive on the grace of God right, well he goes on to say but in addition to that and rejoice in hope of the glory of God well what's the glory of God well one of these days either it's going to happen through the grave or there's going to be a shout with the voice of an archangel right and what's going to happen the glory that God put in us is going to be revealed outwardly right he put in you that new creature because of a man being Christ old things passed away all things become new there's a new man inside of you well one of these days new man's going to meet up with new body and the glory of Christ will be revealed in us in fact that's a Apostle Paul said it's a great mystery that God would choose to put himself in earthen vessels. Right? To keep it hidden. Secret. We don't have Mount of Transfiguration moments in our life where if we read enough and we study enough and we pray enough and we attend church enough that Jesus on the inside just shows out on the outside and everybody else, you know, struck down blind like the Apostle Paul was on the road to Damascus. That don't happen. You know what does happen? He did give us a light, tell us to shine it. They said there's a way that people can know what's in you is different 
than what's in them. But here the Apostle Paul says, we rejoice in hope of what we will be one day. Didn't our pastor preach on not too long ago, oh, wretched man that I am? You know who wrote that? The Apostle Paul. You know what the Apostle Paul is saying here in verse number 2? He's saying, I know how wretched I am now. I know that the only reason I'm standing is because of the grace of God. He says, but I rejoice. Right? That is a present tense. I rejoice now because of the hope of what I will be in Christ one day. Do you realize that when we get that new body, our existence for all of eternity is the glory of God? That's the finished and final work of what Christ started at Calvary. Most people think getting saved is the end. No, no, no. The end is when you are as God sees you right now. Your conversation is already recorded in heaven. There's a spot at the marriage supper, the Lent, whatever, if it's a dining table, if it's a, I, I don't know, because I believe that, you know, if all of us are there, God's going to want us to have a good view of the bridegroom. It may not be one big old long table. Right? It might be set up like a big old round table. Right? Well, who's in the middle? Jesus. Yeah, what's it going to be like, Brother Jordan? I don't know, but it's going to be great. But you know what each one of us sitting around that table are going to be? We are the glory or the finished work of what Christ did on Calvary. We are the testament of what God did. He took something that was nothing. And because of His mercy, He didn't throw nothing off into you know, everlasting fire. Instead, He loved it. He died for it. He bought it. And then He turned it into the image of His Son. It is the glory. It is the... For all of eternity. If I look around and see you in heaven, you know what I'm going to see? Jesus. Now I'm going to look back at Jesus and say, He did that. It's a testament of the powerful work that God actually did when He saved you. Because He promised that He wouldn't leave you the way that He found you. The Apostle Paul saying, I just every now and then have myself a fit thinking about the fact that one of these days I'm not going to be like I am. I'm going to be like Him. And it's not going to be for my benefit, but it's to bring glory and honor unto His Son. But then in verse number 3, he says, and not only so. He's saying, we got more stuff to glory of, you know, worship about, rejoice over. He says, but we glory in tribulations also. That's a hard verse, Brother Randy. You see, in verse number 2, he's talking about us becoming a bit of God's glory. Right, we say glory and honor over in the book of Revelation. Right, we're going to shout it for all of eternity. Right, the Lamb who was slain and is worthy of glory. My presence in heaven, I get the privilege, the honor of being with Him for all of eternity. But when God sees me, He sees the finished work of Calvary, he sees the glory that his son's actions brought. But in verse number 3, he's saying, we glory, in other words, we rejoice, we worship, we get a little happy on the inside, and it works its way outwards because of tribulations. Now, I can understand, you know, people get excited about things that they made, where it started off as nothing, turned into something. That's a testament of the work of their hands. They can take pride in it. They can glory in it. They can say, God gave me the ability to do that, and I did it to the best of my ability, and it turned out like this. Right? I can understand that. Right? But it's a whole lot harder to understand how when tribulations come my way, I glory in that. I want to rejoice over that. You say, Brother Jordan... That's strange. Well, yeah, we're supposed to be a peculiar people. Does not the Bible tell us that Jesus embraced the shame of the cross for the glory which was set before him? He did not glory in what he had to do on the cross. What was that? He had to take on the sin of all mankind. He had to break fellowship with the Father because the Father could have no fellowship with sin. 
Right? He willingly died so that we wouldn't have to. He did not glory in what he would become. He gloried in what we would become. So why do we glory in tribute? We don't glory because of what we're going through. We glory because of what it will turn us into according to God's will. You know why Paul and Silas were able to pray and sing at midnight when they were in that Philippian jail? They weren't singing and praising God for where they were. They were singing and praising because of what God was going to do. You say, well, did they know that he was going to send an earthquake and open a jail? No. You know what they did know? That if God was done with them, they'd have let them kill them. They knew that God had something else in store. And even if he didn't, like them three Hebrew boys, we are not careful to answer the old, God, old king. But we know who the true God is, and we're not bowing to your fake one. Our God is able to deliver us, but if not, we're still not going to bow down to the fake one. Because right is right. They said, God's God, that isn't. And let God be true and every man a liar. We're not going to stand up and defy the king Nebuchadnezzar because we know that God's going to deliver us. No, we do it because it's right. They gloried in the fact that they were going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. Why? Because it would have freedom from the bondage that they were in. And two, they'd been in paradise because they knew that they did the right thing. They had lived as thus saith the Lord. That, well, in us, Apostle Paul and Silas, they weren't thanking God for all the stripes that they'd just been beaten with or that they'd been chained up in the inner prison. They were praising God because they knew that God was doing this to work another thing in their life. They knew that God had a plan, that God would do it in His timing, and that as a result of it, the gospel would be spread. They gloried in what their tribulation would strengthen them into as a Christian. But I hated running back playing football. Hated track time. It was always hotter on the track because the track was black and the sun makes black things hotter. And it always felt like it was about 300 degrees on that rubber. And they made us start from, you know, down positions, which means your hands was all chewed up from the track by the time you was done. All of it was just miserable. But you know why we did it? Some of them did it because they was afraid of the coaches. Other people did it because they realized running now would pay off when it gets the fall time, when the playoffs are around the corner. And the other guy on the other side of the line sucking air, but you're thinking, it's, it's not too bad right now. That didn't happen because you just decided not to be tired. It happened because of the tribulations. Right? We embrace the tribulations and rejoice in what God will work as a result of the tribulation even if you don't know what it is even if you don't know when it will come about why because God says his ways are above our ways he says that I'm in his hand his hand's in the father's hand no man can pluck me out of the father's hand so it's got to go through God twice before it gets to me God's ordained it to happen in my life and God doesn't just allow things to happen for no reason God's will is that whatever I encounter either gives me an opportunity to Reveals to others what's in me or it's going to make me more like Christ so that further on down the road others will see something different in me. We rejoice in the fact that tribulations mean God's up to something. And when God's up to something something unusual something supernatural and something unimaginable is going to happen because if God does it we can't explain it. We can't even conceive of it. Well, well, he goes on to say, we also glory in tribulation. He gives us just a little peek of what tribulation does in a Christian's life. He says, tribulation worketh patience. That's Brother Randy about a Sunday school lesson on patience. It's been, it's been over a decade, and I still haven't forgotten that one, Brother Randy. And patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not a shame. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. He says, tribulations will teach you some things that you need. Because notice, there is a process here. You don't get to skip from tribulation to hope. 
He says tribulations work patience. Best way I can describe patience is you've got the ability to actually wait until God's ready. Patience isn't being able to endure something for a short amount of time and then work on it until you can get to a longer time. No, patience is being able to have the world thrown at you like Job, but yet, no, this is where God wants me, and until I know that God wants me somewhere else, I'm staying right where God, I know that the will of God is. Where'd Job go to? The ashes on the altar. He sat at the place where he knew that God had always told him, this is where you do business with God. And he was waiting there until God showed up to do business again. Everybody in Job's life came by and said, why in the world are you still even trying? They said, this is where God does business. I know this is where I need to be. The patience of Job was that for 40 chapters, God didn't speak to Job. Job, even by his own testimony, says, the thing he feared most came upon him. He didn't know if God was on the left, on the right, in front of him, behind of him. But he said, I do know where God meets with me, and it's right here on his altar. So that's where he stayed. Did he have doubts? Did he have questions? Did he have friends that tried to tempt him to quit? Did he have a wife that told him to curse God and die? Yeah, but guess where Job stayed? On the altar. That tribulation work is patience. You can't have patience unless you've got something trying to pull you away from where you know God wants you to be. Patience is being able to endure it and stay where God wants you to be. Right? Well, once you develop a little bit of patience, what's he say that brings about? Patience brings experience. Because if you don't have the patience to go through it, you're not going to learn anything from it. Once you get patience, then you can start really learning what it is that God wants you to live out. You show me a Christian without patience, I'll show you a Christian without any experience. Somebody always jumping around from one thing to the other. Somebody that isn't willing to just sit and, you know, that message Brother Buster preached in the old bloom where you planted. They just aren't willing to say, Lord, you put me in this flower pot, I'm going to be the best flower that I can be for you. Until you move me from this flower pot, I'm not going to be a different place. Right? Purposing that I'm going to learn what I can through these tribulations so that I can turn it into living it because of experience. And then he says, then experience brings about hope. About, well, hope, he's already mentioned it twice. He says, verse number two, that we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We rejoice because of what we know he's going to do for us. But once you get a little bit of experience, you realize what we just talked about, that God doesn't let tribulation come just to give you a bad day. God allows tribulation so that you can get more experience. And once you've gone through it once or twice, you start to realize this is because God's not done with me yet. This is because God still wants me to have an impact in somebody's life. If God wants me to have an impact in somebody's life, that means he's not done with the movement of the church. You know what that means? God still wants to save people. Do you know what hope experience brings about? That whenever I'm down to nothing, that God still has a plan, God's still in control, and the hope is that through this, God will get glory from it. It's the same hope that we have back in verse number 2. It's not going to be the glory of me finished in the work of Christ. It's going to be the glory that God could use something that was so vile and you know, the off-scour of the world and he could take that and use it, right? Equip it. That's what experience is. So that when it encounters tribulation, God can still get glory from my life here. We know that one day we're going to bring glory and honor to God because of what he promised to make us into. But this here is a hope that my decisions down here, because I love them and I choose to do what I do for them, that that will bring glory to God. You know what will keep you going in a hard time? Realizing that you're, the very fact that 
you choose to face it. That you get up and you say, Lord, I know that this is for a reason. And you realize that my actions can bring glory to the Almighty God. That'll keep you putting one foot in front of the other. Because if my eyes are on how I feel, where I'm at, what I think is going on, I have no hope. My hope is in the fact that God knows what He's doing and it'll be worth it after all. Not just all of eternity, all of the rest of my life here. Whether it's an hour or whether it's a day, it's going to be a whole lot better being in the perfect will of God. Whether it's for another hundred years, it's always worth being in the perfect will of God, even if it brings tribulations, because we know that the glory of God will be revealed through us here, not just there. That song, right? I know how I made it. it wasn't because I was strong enough to get through the tribulation. I made it by grace. But well, where is God's grace the most powerful? His strength is made perfect in weakness. You know where God's grace is able to do the most for you? When you've got nothing left but the grace of God. You know where God's able to get the most glory? When you just take your hands off the wheel and say, Lord, you're in control. I know where you want me to be right here. And I'm not going anywhere else. Just like Job. Then verse number 60 says, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. He wraps up all five of these verses by saying, Now we have strength, because when we were without strength, Christ chose to die for us, the ungodly. He's talking about Jew and Gentile there. He has already addressed that two chapters before this. But the Apostle Paul says, you remember what it was like to not have strength? He says, now you have strength. Because when we were without it, Christ loved us anyway. Showed us mercy. And now we have strength by the grace of God. But go back with me in verse number 2. This is by whom, referring to Jesus, we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. Why is somebody able to stand? Because they have strength. Anybody remember the times when Jesus or the apostles healed someone with a palsy? Or they had a withered hand? Or they were lame? What's it say? That they were strengthened. And then what do you find them doing? Most of the time running around leaping and praising God telling everybody that they run past, hey, I used to be lame, but now I'm not. All right, well, verse number 6 tells us that we have strength now because of what Christ did. Because of the access that we have to God's grace. And in verse number 2, he says, we stand. Why? Because of our faith in Christ and because it gave us access to grace. Our strength is the grace of God. That's why God told the Apostle Paul, my strength is made perfect in weakness. You know what he's saying? My grace is made perfect in weakness. Because our strength, our ability to stand, to function, to live, is because of the grace of God. And then, he says, we're able, we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. Right, the grace of God is not a thing, it is a place. He says, wherein we stand. You know why some people don't have the grace of God in their life? Because they're not standing in the right spot. The grace of God is dependent upon two things. One, your salvation. Verse number two. By whom also we have access by faith. Right? Can't have the grace of God... That's salvation. You can receive mercy. God may not throw you off into hell. He may deal with you as a lost person. He does all that through mercy. But in order to get grace, you got to be in the family. you got to have access. Right? Well, he goes on to say that we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. First thing we had no control over. We just accepted Christ. 
didn't realize that when we accepted Christ, we had access to all the treasures of heaven, the grace of God. But the thing that we do have control over is where we stand. Apostle Paul says, you stand in the grace of God. He says, then you get the hope. Remember, if you're in the grace of God, what's going to happen? Well, by God's grace, you're going to face tribulations to make you a stronger Christian. What do tribulations work? Patience. Patience works experience. And then experience works hope. You know why some Christians are so miserable? Got no hope. You know why they have no hope? They have no experience. They have no experience because they have no patience. And they have no patience because they run from the hardness in their life that God brings their way to make them better. The Apostle Paul says, we stand in the grace of God, full well knowing that the grace of God will bring hardness. Because Christ told us to take up our cross and follow Him. Christ didn't tell us to take up the easy way. But furthermore, He said that the world would hate us because they despised Him. He said that because we are the children of God now, we're the enemy of the world. They hate us. They despise us. But God uses their hatred to His glory. He allows tribulation to come our way to show our God's bigger than their hatred. Our God's bigger than anything that they can throw at us. Our God's bigger than the way that I feel on a certain day. He says, we choose to stand in the grace of God because one, we know that tribulations, we can't get through it without the grace of God. But that by the grace of God, this thing which is too big for me, it isn't too big for Him. And He'll use this moment to bring about patience and experience and hope in my life. You want peace? You got to have hope. You want encouragement? That don't come without hope. If you don't believe there's a reason in going on, why would you even try? You wouldn't be looking for encouragement. You'd be looking for the exit. You want to know why but Cody and all these other preachers come up from Carolinas and Georgia and everywhere else saying everybody just jumping off they want to become a reformed fundamentalist right or they want to become a part of this movement or that movement you know why because when hardness comes their way they got no hope maybe because they're not saved or it may be because even though they're saved they never wanted to embrace the tribulations to run from tribulation is to run from the grace of God To run away from hardness is to run away from the very tools that God wants to give you so that you can live a victorious life. Am I saying every day is going to be living in Canaan land? No. But every day you'll be living in the grace of God. And what's the grace of God? Our strength. Because we have the strength to stand. We have the strength to get up and do what God wants us to do. We wake up and we're not insane from all of the insanity going on in the world because through the Holy Ghost, which verse number 5 tells us, right, hope maketh not ashamed, right, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. The Holy Ghost isn't just there to keep you saved, it's a gift. Right, that's God, the Almighty, one of the three in the Trinity, dwelling in you he says that the Holy Ghost one of the things that, what's the first fruit of the Spirit love right why in verse number 5 why does our hope make us not ashamed to face hardness to face criticism to face ridicule to face the struggle of you fighting against your flesh to face everybody on the job and have enough Holy Ghost boldness to stand up and say, don't care what y'all think, this is what I believe because I know it to be true because the proof is in what Jesus did in my life. Where's that boldness come from? From your hope. But once you get a little bit of hope, what to tell you'll have? Hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God 
is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. That's not talking about the love of God towards us. That's saying that God gave us a love to love Him with. You could not love God when you were lost. It took the Holy Ghost shedding the love of God in your heart so that you could love God the way that God says you should love Him. You know what hope does? It strengthens your love for the Father. But so many people love God as long as everything's easy. That's not scriptural. Because I've taken you through all the verses today that show if you want a stronger love for God, you'll embrace the hardness because you realize the finished work is that you love God more at the end of it than you did at the beginning. And if you love that God that much, you'll stay in His grace regardless of what tribulation comes because you love Him more than you love the easy way or you love taking the escape plan. You love God more than you love the people that you know your flesh seeks the approval of. But every tribulation we face, the more grace that God gives us, you know what it does? It sheds forth more love in our heart for Him. And the more we love Him, the more that we'll love others. The more that we love Him and we love others, we love ourselves less. You know why we can glory in our tribulations? Because we realize it's not about what happens to us. It's about what God does in us for other people. It's about what He does in us to bring glory to Him. Every tribulation, if you stand in the grace of God, focus gets shifted off of you and onto Him. And He'll point out others in your life that He wants you to have an impact on. You know how that happens? Through tribulations. Because if it was the easy days that made an impact in everybody's life, right? Every movement would have converts all over the place. But the ones that get changed are the ones that are wrought, just like Christ had to wrought us our salvation through the cross you've got to go through a little bit of tribulation to make a difference in somebody else's life so you want to know what most Christians nowadays are missing you know what revival will take us back to having glory in our tribulations do you struggle to find good Bible based resources to supplement your personal devotions if so head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on bookstore where we have a ton of resources and as always thanks for listening